big play ability. Um, yeah, I think he's going to contribute a lot for Alabama this season. I don't think it's fair to put the expectation on him to start right away. Um, could he start by the end of the year? Maybe. Um, but we've kind of seen where – at the receiver position, there have been years where guys that freshmen come in and play right away and play significant minutes. And then there's guys that kind of have to wait their turn behind other guys. Like even I think just build wise, a lot of people compare Ryan Williams to Devontae Smith and it's like Smitty didn't. Um, I mean, he played up. So obviously he had the, the catch in the national championship, but before that his freshman year, he wasn't um, playing a ton. And so, um, I, but I think Ryan Williams is also stepping into a different wide receiver room than what Devontae Smith was in and some of those guys. So, um, you know, it, it, tomorrow will be – I'm excited. That's one of the things I'm most excited about for tomorrow is to see him for the first time in action. We've heard a lot, haven't been able to see a lot yet. Um, and so to actually see him play, see how much he's in there with the first team, kind of how much he plays, um, if he's able to make some big plays, um, that'll that's kind of one of the things I'm looking forward to. Well, I'm really, really excited. Uh, so excited that I think I messed up our stream a little bit. We might have just uh, gotten restarted there. We're not going to rewind the last three or four or five minutes, uh, but we're all excited. This is Football Friday on the Joe Cather Show. I'm Joe Cather with Kim Rankin, Scott Solomon, and Katie Windham, Bama Central, Miami Hurricanes on SI, and Boston College on SI. We are getting set up for a big week number one, and we're in the middle of talking about Ryan Williams. Kim, we saw Ryan Williams a couple of times in, in the, on the Alabama a high school scene um a lot of he's the best wide receiver i've ever seen he's the best athlete i've ever seen a lot of uh major superlatives about ryan williams so we will obviously be looking for him tomorrow what are the fair expectations Do we, are we agreeing with katie that uh okay maybe we were over over emphasizing what he might do early on in the in, the, in fall camp but now uh what, what, what do you think what do you think about what, what ryan Williams would do for this offense Absolutely. I Like you said, we covered him a couple times at the previous outlet throughout high school football. I definitely kind of agree that I think he was a little overrated as a recruit and kind of coming into the beginning of fall camp. But I also believe that although he's a freshman, it's going to be interesting to see how Kalen DeBoer and the rest of the coaching staff deal with freshmen. I know sometimes Nick Saban didn't always give freshmen an opportunity uh, or as many minutes as, as other um, players. So I think it'd be interesting, but I also agree. I think he's going to be one of the top contributors to the passing offense. And I think he's going to be probably the, the best rookie for Alabama this year on the All offensive right. side, at least. All right. So Katie, are we getting in the end zone tomorrow? Is Ryan going to get in the end zone? Uh, Yes, I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll make a. We we did our adjustment earlier this week about who we think was for the first touchdown. Neither of us went with him, but I think we'll see a Ryan Williams touchdown this Saturday. Let's let's. Katie, I think there. Western Kentucky is so bad. We're going to see you in the end zone. You know what? Maybe maybe when I'm down on the field at the in the fourth quarter, we'll see. Well, that's somewhere I want to go to. Is Western Kentucky? I mean, uh, Tyson Helton has won eight games or more in all four, all five of his seasons going into year number six. This is not a slouch program. Katie, South Alabama, the last time K. Womack played Western Kentucky, he lost, what, 44 to 23 in a New Orleans Bowl you know, at the end of the 2022 season. Uh, TJ Finley, last year at Texas State, put up 52 points and beat South Alabama as well. So there's some elements on the other side of the football for uh, that Alabama's facing uh, that some of these, you know, obviously you've got different athletes here all, all, all on the Alabama sideline than you did at South Alabama when you were when you were coaching as Kane Womack. But there are some elements here that didn't really go uh, Kane Womack's way. And, and, and Western Kentucky is not a slouch program. So I, I just wonder how much – of the, how much of a factor are those elements that Tyson Helton has had the better of Kane Womack before? And TJ Finley has seen at least schematically this defense before. Obviously, the athletes will be a bit different. Uh, but how, how much are those elements going to be a factor on Saturday? Or will it not be a factor basically because of the athletic difference between South Alabama and, uh, and the Crimson Tide? Yeah, I think there's a lot – bigger gap between <laughs> South Alabama and Alabama. I do think the TJ Finley factor is at, at least like, you know, he played in the SEC at two different schools, so he's not going to be intimidated necessarily by the size of 
Alabama's defense because he's literally faced them before. He's not going to be intimidated by the stadium or the crowd um, or the stage. But as far as the rest of the team, yeah, I just think there's a huge gap between the the talent and athleticism and size of what Alabama will have and what Western Kentucky will have. It is like I was listening to college sports radio earlier today and they were talking about, I think on the, the Thursday night games, like 19 of the 21 or something like that. We're like FCS versus FBS. I mean, this isn't like as bad as that. Like this isn't a FCS opponent. Western Kentucky is a pretty solid mid major, but I don't think that um, will necessarily translate into them being competitive with Alabama on Saturday. Scott, what do you what do you make of that with TJ Finley? TJ Finley coming into Bryant Denny Stadium. He's played Alabama twice already. Uh, freshman year at LSU, sophomore year at Auburn. Lost both of those games. Uh, got benched redshirt sophomore year at Auburn. Then transfers to Texas State. He's played fairly well, over 300 yards against Kane Womack uh, last year when it was uh, when he was coaching at South Alabama. Now T.J. Finley has transferred to Western Kentucky, so it will be his first year in the uh, Tyson Helton system, but he's played. This will be his third time playing Alabama and his second time playing the uh, Kane Womack defense. Is that – does that give any sort of element to the Hilltoppers saying, okay, we can hang in this game, not make it competitive. We're not going to fool ourselves here, but at least hang around and make it entertaining on Saturday. I happen to like Finley a lot. I liked him when he was at Auburn. Uh, I think he's got an opportunity to put on a show tomorrow because he's going to have a national audience that he's going to be able to, to play in front of. Everyone's going to want to see the highlights from the Alabama game not necessarily from the Western Kentucky game, but everyone's going to want to see the highlights from the game. And uh, I, I just believe that he's going to uh, come out, he's going to be strong, and he's got the ability to put some points on the board. I think that uh, Alabama's going to have their hands full with him. So, so, Kim, it'll be your only time covering Alabama this year because you're going to be focused on Boston College. The calendar lines up just right for you. We've uh, been really dialed into Alabama all for the last six, seven, eight months now that Kalen DeBoer has taken over. We've answered all kinds of questions. We've played the what's your biggest question about Alabama almost every third week for the last seven months. Now that you have right at 24 hours, where Alabama's kicking off at 6 p.m. tomorrow night, uh, what is the last question remaining for the Crimson Tide heading into the 2024 season? Oh, geez. Um, I – I don't know if I have like one specific like last question. I'm just kind of intrigued to just see with, you know, a new head coach, which none of us have really seen in, you know, so many years. I think we were all kids back when Nick Saban uh, came in, but uh, I, I'm just it, very interested to see kind of Kalen DeBoer's coaching style. Cause although he is a very winning coach, it's his first time coaching in the sec and he's going to be playing against a quarterback who, like you said, has played in the sec and against other sec opponents. So I'm just really, really intrigued to just see how he does in his first actual game as the Alabama head coach. Katie, I need to throw that to you because we haven't talked about that really as an aspect uh, of this season. You're the Alabama. You're, you're the you're born and bred in Alabama. Uh, your family, obviously, University of Alabama family. What will it be like? Have you thought about what it'll be like at five forty-eight or so when you realize that? Oh goodness, great. I mean, you you've known it, but when it really hits you that Nick Saban is not walking down that tunnel. Yeah, it's definitely going to be different. I think one thing, this isn't like a big question mark. This is kind of just like a joke question of like, what will Kalen DeBoer wear tomorrow? Because for the last 17 years, Nick Saban wore the coach's polo. I don't see I don't see Kalen doing that just based on what he wore at, at some of his other stops. Um, you know, on the cover of the media guide, I think he is wearing the coach's polo. So maybe there's some sort of deal with Nike where he has to wear it. But that just doesn't really seem to be his vibe with, you know, the – the belts and the tucked in and khakis. I, I just can't really see that from him, but yeah, it's going to be different. Um, you know, I was obviously young when I, Saban came to Alabama, but I do remember um, a little bit of, of uh, really Shula's. I was alive for some of the other coaches, but really all that I, I remember. Um, so yeah, it's, it's going to be, I, I've even been thinking about, you know, the tunnel video um, because for, 
And it's interesting now that I've been everywhere in the SEC, I think except for Missouri and now Oklahoma, which we'll go to later this year. It's interesting to see at all the different spots, how they handle pregame hype videos and what some schools barely do anything at all. Alabama kind of has the various levels because they have the national championship video. They have the tradition is video that shows tradition is built on toughness, whatever. And it ends with the Bear Bryant quote. Um, and it's like, will that now be a Saban quote? Will the tunnel video still feature Saban or will they be trying to, um, you know, highlight on DeBoer a lot? I think it's kind of interesting because, you know, Saban, I feel like had a couple more iconic lines in his opening press conference of like, uh, we want them to say, we hate playing these guys. Basically, all I can remember that's kind of like that from Kalen's is like the standard is Alabama. So I'm sure that line will be in there. But even things like that, I'm thinking about that will be different for tomorrow. And just uh, I think tomorrow they're going to try and make it more about Kalen. And then next Saturday when it's the Saban field dedication, I think we'll see a little bit more of the um, a little bit more focus on Saban. Oh, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting. All these uh, little nuances that I haven't really considered. Obviously, I'm really uh, more focused on what's gonna happen on the field. But there's gonna be a lot of these, you know, little old ladies kind of crying. It's gonna be different. Oh man, I I, I cannot wait for it. I think that uh, Alabama's in a really good position to move forward. Uh, let's do a little something. Let's welcome in one more person. Let's welcome on Joey Van Zimmeren, uh, Mizzou Central. And before we let Joey uh, gloat, we need to go back because I did fail uh, starting our podcast. We need to go back and reread our Purple Turtle Roofing advertising. Uh, they are the number one roof replacement company in Alabama and Mississippi, Purple Turtle Roofing. Whether it's addressing leaks, storm damage, or general wear and tear, Purple Turtle Roofing is going to be there to deliver your exceptional roof repair for your property. You can call Dustin Foley and his team today at 877-PT-ROOF-5 for your free roof inspection. One of his uh, one of his employees will come out, they'll check out your roof for free, and they'll make sure that you're prepared for any and all of life's storms. Call them today at 877-787-6635 or check them out online at www.roofturtle.com. Joey, I'm offended today. I recorded the Missouri game last night. Uh, so mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, I'm going to watch Minnesota and, and North Carolina. I'll come back to Missouri in the morning. And obviously, I'm keeping up with it just on my social medias. I didn't realize your very first move as a head coach, uh, your very first move. I mean, Katie, you wouldn't believe this. Uh, what's his name? Uh, Jody, Jody Wright. Right. Jody Wright, thank you. Jody Wright, head coach for Murray State last night, opens his head coaching tenure. He's never head coach, he's never been a head coach anywhere else before. Very first time being a head coach, his first play as a 50-point underdog on a Thursday night on the road in an SEC stadium is oh, I'm just gonna call a surprise onside kick. What do you want to lose? You're a 50-point dog. Exactly. I love it. I think yeah, that I, is, I love and it. Then, I think it's the room. next point, the next time that their first offensive possession, they go three and out. Well, four and out because oh, it's third and it's third and one. Uh, now it's fourth and one from my own thirty-five, and I'm just going to go for it again. I, what better? I'm, I'm sorry, I was offended because I thought, what message are you sending to these players? You're sending these players. The message you're sending to these guys is F it. They're, they're, I mean, you're, we're not going to win anyway. So we may as well just, you know, oh, pick and choose. No. We'll just. Ah, former Alabama staffer, Jody, right? I didn't realize he was the. That's coach. why I was so offended. The Nick Saban coaching coach. tree, yeah. Oh, well, Joey, so tell us this. about the game. Good afternoon. Tell us about the game. <laughs> so Jody, Jody, right. And this pre-game press conference earlier this week. He wears a Ted Lasso Believe shirt. Um, now, I don't know if that's bad luck because during fall camp when Eli Drinkwitz was growing out his his fall camp mustache, he looked a lot like Ted Lasso. So I don't know if he if that was why it didn't work out for Jody Wright. But look, I, I tweeted immediately after it happened. I was like, I love this from Jody Wright. This is probably the best situation where you can say, why not? Um, I think... If you're gonna have, if you're gonna do some, if you're gonna pull off some unprecedented uh, turn of events, you gotta do some unprecedented stuff at the beginning of the game. So, didn't work out for him. But I, I respect it. I get what you're saying too, though, Joe. To maybe not the message you want to send to your players, but I, I think they have their a good head on their shoulders to realize what they're getting into and that it's, you know, 
uh, this game isn't to win for Murray State. It's about exposure more than anything else. But great game for Missouri. Me and my um, other football writer, Michael Stamps, we were talking about it during this week of what really constitutes a success for Missouri in this game because so much of it is just go out there, take care of business, and then move on to the next week um, before facing Buffalo on this upcoming Saturday. So they did that, but then also they stay mostly healthy. They did have tight end Brett Norfleet and Theo Weiss eventually exit the game with injuries. But from here and from Drinkwitz after the game, it seems like that was just an overcautious move. And if they had any sort of soreness from their starters, they would have pulled them out of the game. So no, no concerns there. Really strong showing from the defense with the first game under new coordinator Corey Batoon. Um, really showed up a, a lot of the depth pieces defensively. Um, exciting to see a lot of those young guys to offense and defense underclassmen um, that really showed out just because we're not going to see them for another year or two. So strong showing from a lot of those guys as well. Um, the two running backs, Marcus Carroll and Nate Noel, looked really impressive in person. So Overall, Missouri, you know, at the end of the day, you can't take away too much from this game. But overall, I, I think they have some positive takeaways to take into week two. All right. That's exactly where I want to dive into. The, you, the, your very last point was my biggest takeaway from the game. The biggest point for Missouri was how are you going to are you going to replace Cody Schrader? Uh, obviously, mm -hmm. his NFL journey, you guys have been documenting it at Missouri Tigers on SI. He's picked up to was it the 49ers practice squad? Uh, no, the Rams claimed him on waivers, so he is on the Rams' 53-man uh, roster. Great. All right, so he's made it through and he's on the roster. Uh, but when I put it back on uh, this morning, it was Nate Noel and it was Michael Carroll – or Marcus Carroll, excuse me. Marcus, yeah. They were impressive to me. And I think yeah. that you know, if they are able to replace Cody Schrader – uh, then maybe that Missouri offense is going to be picking right up where it left off last year. I thought they were impressive as a pair. Yeah, I'm really excited to see the both of them when we actually get into SEC play. But yeah, I was really impressed seeing Marcus Carroll in person. I, I knew of, we all knew of Nate Noel's agility and his quickness, and that was that's more of his his game compared to Marcus Carroll, who is more of a bruising back. But then Marcus comes out here, and obviously it is Murray State, but he had some really nice quick cuts too. There were some plays where Nate, Nate Noel took most carries on the first two or three drives. And then Marcus Carroll was being shuffled in more. And there was some plays that Marcus Carroll had where I thought it was Nate Noel. I mean, it doesn't help that the, their jersey numbers and the font they use for Missouri's jerseys doesn't make it easy to differentiate between Nate Noel's eight and Marcus Carroll's number nine. But also, just with how quick Marcus Carroll was with cutting in and out, um, impressive showing from the both of them. All right, last week when we, when you and I chatted, we talked about the sold-out Faroe Field. They ended up selling out Faroe Field on, what, Tuesday, Wednesday. So congratulations, Eli Drinkwitz. You got your sellout. How was the atmosphere last night? Was everybody in? Obviously, you're playing a lesser opponent, a 50-point game. But uh, how, 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 how was the fan base and the atmosphere? Yeah, I was surprised, honestly, with how much it filled up. Obviously, I, I knew it was a sell, sellout, but still surprised – Almost every seat uh, filled in there at kickoff. Uh, Drinkwitz, another one of his plights with the fan base over the years has been the fact that they tailgate too long. So about midway through last season, he, he said, we need, you, <laughs> we need you 30 minutes before kickoff to be in your seat so we can have you there for all the pregame hype. So they, they delivered on that too. Was impressed, especially with the, the student section getting there early and staying there longer than I expected. This game was over after the first four plays. Um, Missouri student section stayed there for a good amount of time. Uh, overall crowd stayed there for a good amount of time and just exciting, uh, you know, for the first game of the season to, to get back into it. And I always go down to the field when the starters are being announced and it's always fun for that to really gauge crowd reception of some of these players and especially Brady cook. Um, I, it's been, well, you know, almost a full year now since they booed him and he's done a lot to, to change that around. But every time, Freddie Cook is announced in starting warmups. I always pay special attention to um, the uh, applause and noise he, he gets. So that was that was present against last night and great atmosphere for a FCS opponent. 
All right, one other guy that we talked about a handful of times this summer, Toriano Pride. It did not take yeah. him very long before busting out on that out route, uh, getting the, the pick six, and really an athletic play. What did you see yeah. from him? Obviously, that one play was very special, but just as an entire uh, performance, his first game uh, in a Missouri uniform. Yeah, exactly. And I, I talked about the play in our, our post game reaction video for this. Of it, it's a terrible, it's a terrible throw by a lot of players on Murray State, or a terrible play by a lot of players on Murray State. You have the right tackle who really struggles blocking defensive end Zion Young, and Zion is just all in the the face of Jaden Johansson. Jaden, the smart thing there is, it's a first and ten. You can take the sack um, because he's he's thrown it to the right sideline on a receiver that's pretty poorly positioned on an out route. And then Torian Pride, he's in zone coverage, um, pretty soft, obviously, because it's first and 10. And so he's he's still three or four yards out from this receiver and from where he jumps to get the interception when at the time when Johansson, the quarterback, throws this ball. And he really quickly gets over there, makes a leap up for that, um, and, and then just starts to the end zone. So good showing for Pride. Um, uh, of course, seeing the the sidelines reaction to it was very cool too. And hearing from the players after the game, it seems like that it, love for Pride really comes for uh, not only the play he made, but also um, the just the respect they have for him. Nate Noel, the running back, uh, afterwards he was talking about how um, how great it is to see guys that really work, um, really put in the work to to have their moments like that. So um, that that was an exciting play, and that was. Uh, the, the dagger. Oh, yeah. It, 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 like in the first minute and a half, it was just like, oh my gosh, because Jody Wright kicks the onside kick. He goes to <laughs> the fourth field. He goes forward on fourth down. He gives him a short field. Then they throw a pick six and the game is over. Like, I get it, Jody <laughs> Wright. You got it. You want to say, oh, we have nothing to lose. Put my, you know, cojones on the table. And, you know, I'm, I, I believe in my team. But you shot your team in the foot right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, Give you guys I, a chance. I tweeted after uh, Pride's interception that Missouri was on pace to win 168 to nothing. So, <laughs> I mean, if they really wanted to, I think they could have done that. I like the aggression, but come on, you got to be smart about it. Well, Joey, I appreciate yeah. you jumping in and joining us. I know it was a late night for the Missouri Tigers on SI. Encourage everybody to read the post game coverage and reaction at Missouri Tigers on SI. Follow Joey Van Zimmeren at Joey BZ underscore. He was in for uh, in for O Field last night. Obviously, Buffalo is on the horizon, and then you're going to have a date with our friend Kim Rankin. Boston College is on the schedule mm -hmm. as well, so we'll get into that at a later date. Let's start turning it into Saturday. We talked uh, at the very beginning of the episode about Alabama and Western Kentucky, just a little bit about expectations, last few questions, and Ryan Williams. Now we've got our uh, – it oh, looks like Joey is gone. That's okay. If he wants to leave us, that's no problem. Let's talk about the games that are happening Saturday. We've got six games on our, on our weekend slate, one on Sunday, one on Monday. What I want to do is I want to bring Scott. Let's go to you. Let's, let's talk about Miami, Florida. Then we'll talk about Boston College, Florida State with uh, with Kim, and then we'll pick all six games. I've got spreads. Georgia, Clemson, Georgia, 11.5-point favorite. Miami, 2.5-point favorite over Florida. Texas A&M, a 3-point favorite over Notre Dame. Alabama, 31.5, Kim, uh, Kim and Katie. 31.5 is our Alabama number this week. LSU at four points, and Florida State at 16.5. But let's start with Scott Solomon, Miami Hurricanes on SI. Huge expectations. Scott, we I've talked with Justice three, four, six different times this summer. And every time, Justice is is uh, riding the Hurricanes high. Thinks that uh, Miami has a chance to win the ACC. All eyes on Mario Cristobal. They've hammered the transfer portal. We've been hammering the, recruit, the, the recruiting rankings. And this is the year. Are you in agreement with Justice? Is everything uh, lining up for the Miami Hurricanes uh, to have a very strong season and make the college football playoff? Well, I've got a column coming out this afternoon. Please. Or tonight that basically centers around the fact that this is the one year if Miami ever had a chance to win the ACC, this is it. Uh, they finally have that marquee quarterback – and the speed receivers on the outside that can run that nine route 
and a quarterback that can get him the ball, and Miami can put some big numbers up. Miami never really had a problem on defense. They had a problem with the offensive line, but they've built that up. Mario's brought in the the cream of the crop because he's an offensive line guru, as you know, Uh, and he's got Alex Mirabal with him. And I think the defensive line, the game's going to be won in the trenches. The defensive line, Florida's going to have to stop Akeem Mesidor, and they're going to have to stop Ruben Bain. And I don't know if there's a college team out there outside of – one of the the other SEC schools like Alabama or Georgia that have the ability to do that. Yeah, Miami's defensive line looks to be ooh, top three unit in the country, maybe top two unit in the country. They they look very very formidable. Uh, so it starts this Saturday with the Florida Gators, and a lot of attention uh, from our end, the Alabama end, has been put on Florida as far as Billy Napier and his job status. Florida has maybe the toughest, the second toughest uh, schedule in the country this year. And Miami is a huge part of that. You just kind of highlighted Cam Ward. Uh, but how, what, what do you see? How do you see this game unfolding? It'll be tomorrow, 2.30 uh, in the swamp. It'll be, it'll be the chance for both these teams to get off to the, uh, to the, to, on, on the right foot. Well, I think it's going to be a difficult game for both teams. Uh, Miami's a two-and-a-half-point favorite, which actually means they're a five-and-a-half-point favorite because you get three points for playing at home. So they think that Miami is going to win the game by almost a touchdown. I like the fact that Miami has what they have coming back. They, they attack the transfer portal very well. I really like Sam Brown and Isaiah Horton on the outside. Uh, you got to look at Xavier Restrepo at, at your slot receiver. Uh, he's one of the best receivers in the country, if not the best in the ACC coming back. Uh, I just think that they have too much firepower for Florida, and I don't think Billy Napier is going to be able to keep up. Uh, As Justice and I discussed yesterday regarding Graham Mertz, the quarterback for Florida, he's very accurate, but he's accurate on checkdowns. Yep. And Justice, you know, pointed that out to me because I had uh, written yesterday that he's very accurate on the run. And Justice said to me, he says, yeah, he's accurate on the run, throwing a three- or four-yard check down. He said, tell me how he's doing to get the ball to the receivers on the outside, on the perimeter. And I'm like, well, you know, you, you, you just might have a point there. And Miami's secondary is probably their weakest link, but they've got Mish Powell, who played at Washington for Kalen DeBoer last year, and I think he's going to anchor the secondary. And I think it's going to be a long day for the Gators. What's it do for Mario Cristobal when you've got all these circumstances aligned as far as talent goes and you obviously have uh, circumstances of of an expanded college football playoff? What does it do for Mario Cristobal to have a huge rivalry game scheduled first up, to basically keep the team on edge throughout the summer to, okay, we do have all this talent, but there's a pretty big game to start the season? Well, I kind of like it. Because when you play with a, with a cupcake the first week, you're not going to be able to gauge how your team can perform. And you're not going to be able to make the right adjustments. So when you start out with a quality opponent like Florida, you're going to be able to see what you have and what you don't have right away. Uh, Miami had a problem a couple of years ago where they lost early games to Middle Tennessee State. And that was... Uh, the, 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 the closest that the fan base came to wanting to run Mario out of town. And we can't let that happen again. So we have to be on our uh, finest performance tomorrow. We have to be able to make sure everyone is at their, at their peak at the, at, and make sure that from, from the kickoff, they're ready to go. We're hanging out with Scott Salomon from Miami Hurricanes on SI. You can follow him on the Twitter machine at Scott Salomon NFL. 
Let's talk about Cam Ward because that was the big get. Obviously, the transfer portal, Mario Cristobal has done well outside of quarterback, but there was a little bit of a sweepstakes between Florida State, Miami, or the NFL for Cam Ward. Is he the real deal? Is he going to be the uh, the ingredient that delivers Miami uh, that ACC championship or that really strong season that the uh, Hurricanes fans are looking for? There's two elements to Cam Ward's game. Which, which you can actually say is, is, is a pair of elements for any quarterback, the physical game and the cerebral part of the game. And he excels at both. He's a student of the game. He knows the game very well. He just needs to make the right decisions. And if he can control the football and not give it away, it's going to be a long day for Florida. I'm going to be at the game, so I am hoping that – they take Florida out early, so I don't have to hear that gator chomp the whole afternoon. Uh, but I believe that it's going to start out. Uh, I'd like to see Miami get the ball first, put their offense on the field, and see what it does. Well, it's going to be a lot of fun. You can follow Scott Salomon at Miami Hurricanes on SI. He will be in Gainesville tomorrow covering Miami and Florida. We'll circle back around to get all of our picks on Miami and, and Florida. At 2.30, Kim, let's spin it up to uh, to Monday. Your weekend is going to be a lot of fun in Bryant Denny Stadium on Saturday in Tallahassee. What's that? Doak Campbell Stadium on, on Monday. First, What's that drive going to be like for you? And second, how did what's the Boston College reaction to week zero? You saw Florida State go down. Does the belief go up in the Boston College fan base uh, behind the uh, as they're uh, looking at Florida State on Monday night? Oh, hold on. <laughs> Okay. First off, yeah, the drive, uh, I actually just drove past 65 earlier this morning running errands, and it's already a parking lot for Labor Day traffic, so I'm really thankful I'm leaving on Sunday. That way I'll I'll be past all the traffic because I think everyone's going to kind of be in the Florida area by then. Um, but, yeah, back roads almost the whole way, but should be fine. Uh, but, yeah, I think it's going to be fun. I, I don't think – my thing with Boston College and Florida State in this matchup – is we've talked about it doing your show every week that you know both you and I have both picked Florida State to win this game and I don't think week zero changes that I Boston College fans do I've seen I've seen many many Boston College fans as you know I've been watching the reaction to the week zero loss against Georgia Tech saying that they think you know Boston College is just going to steamroll Florida State now I still give Florida State the advantage. I think they're going to be angry. They're playing at home. And regardless of how good or bad Florida State is, that is one of the toughest places to play in college football. I still give them the advantage. I think it's going to be closer than maybe I previously thought it would be. But honestly, I don't think Boston College is really like out of this game. Uh, and I never have. Like over the summer, even though I picked Florida State and I still do pick Florida State, I don't think that has changed. Uh, if you had told me, if, if someone came down to me, before week zero, during week zero, after week zero, and they said, hey, Boston College is going to win one of those two games, either against Florida State and Missouri, who do you think it's going to be? I'm not going to tell you who, but who? I would pick Florida State. I just, I think they have a chance to win. I've always thought they have a chance to win. I think the chance is a little higher because of the week zero loss, but I still think it's going to be a difficult challenge for them. So I still see Florida State uh, pulling it off, maybe in a little tighter of a game than originally thought, but I think the Seminoles pull it out on Monday night still. All right, what have you learned from Bill O'Brien and Thomas Castellanos in the last week heading into game week as you are finishing your prep? Yeah, uh, basically, I think the one thing I've learned is how ready they are. And, I mean, you can say you're ready and then maybe show differently on the field. But I think every player, including uh, Thomas Castellanos and head coach Bill O'Brien, I think they're all kind of locked into this mindset of, hey, we want to win. We want to win for them. You've been seeing it all summer, but I think it's a little more – um, telling and showing this week as they're getting ready to prep and kind of getting ready to go out there. I mean, Bill O'Brien was on um, the BC football show last night that they do on like a local radio station up in Boston. And he said, Thomas Castellanos has done a 180 since, you know, he came in in February up until this point. So I just think everyone, you know, in the Boston college, the coaches, the players, everybody in that program just have the right mindset. They want to go in there. They want to win. I think they're focused and dialed in and know what they have to do to come out of that, especially because it's an opponent they play almost every year, if not every single year. Um, and they want revenge from last year. You know, they were so close to beating Florida State last year at home during the Red Bandana game. 
barely lost 31-29. A lot of penalties hurt them in that game. And I think they're looking for revenge. And I, I think they want to prove that they can beat a team like Florida State and kind of make a statement to the college football world about, hey, we're here. We're better than we were last year. Let me prove it here. How much will being the only game on that Monday night? Obviously, there won't be any NFL, uh, no Monday Night Football, or no other college football games to compete with. How much will being the only game on television that night uh, maybe help Bill O'Brien's mission to kind of establish his uh, his vision at Boston College? I think it'll be big if the game is competitive. You know, if 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 Boston College goes in there and just gets steamrolled, I think people are just going to be like, ah, this is Boston College, like. I, I think it's going to be a little more negative, but I think if they play a competitive, close, tight game, people are going to be like, oh, well, Boston College is actually pretty good, or oh, they could really do something here, or oh, they could be like a quiet threat maybe in the conference later on, um, because not only is it just a Monday where nothing else is on, it's also a holiday. You're going to expect a lot of people to just kind of be watching football on a holiday, you know, Monday, and, and that Labor Day night game has really become a staple in college football, especially over the last 10 or so years. And so, yeah, I think if it's a close game, I think it's going to change a lot of people's perspective on not only like Bill O'Brien and Boston College, but just just the game in general and the program as a whole. So but again, if, I think if it's if it's not a tight game, which I expect it to be, I don't expect them to get steamrolled at all. But uh, yeah, I think if they play close, it's going to it's going to turn a lot of eyes to that program for sure. Well, Kim Rankin will have a very busy weekend covering Alabama and Western Kentucky on Saturday in Bryant Denny Stadium and then driving down to Tallahassee to cover Boston College and Florida State for Boston College on SI. Let's close out the program by making our picks for the weekend. We've got six games on deck. We will pick uh, the six games against the spread. Before we do that, I want to tell you about my friend Derek Daniel at State Farm Insurance. You can call him at 205 758 91 for all of your insurance needs, whether it be home, life, auto insurance, you need renter's insurance, boaters insurance, or trailer RV, whatever you need, Derek Daniel can get you taken care of. Call him at 205-758-3391. He's got three great team members, Red, Reese, and Victoria. They can answer all of your insurance questions, get you on and off the phone very, very quickly with all the information that you need. as 205-758-3391. Like you a good neighbor, Derek Daniel, and State Farm is there. All right, six games on the docket, and we appreciate Scott Salomon, Katie Windham, and Kim Rankin for hanging out with us today. Uh, I know it's been uh, a kind of chaotic hour, but the first football Friday always is. I've got these written in order. We'll play them against the line. We're playing Clemson, Georgia, Miami, Florida, Notre Dame A&M, Western Kentucky, Alabama, USC, LSU, and Boston College, Florida State. And we'll just take them in order uh, on the clock. So we're starting with number 14, Clemson, taking on Georgia. Georgia, 11.5-point favorite in Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Will Kirby Smart have his Bulldogs keyed up? Still talking revenge from last season. Katie Wyndham, how do we think the season opening game goes in Mercedes-Benz Stadium? I think Georgia's going to win. I do think the spread's a little high. Um, I was inter- I was listening to a podcast earlier, which at the time, I think the spread was actually 13 and a half. So it's gone down a little bit. And they were saying that's like the biggest underdog Clemson's been since like 2012 or something. And just kind of looking at how basically Clemson and Georgia have swapped places in college football of Georgia is now where Clemson was a couple years ago, perennially in the, the college football playoff and the championship game winning titles. Um, you know, I'm sure Dabo will have them fired up and have a message about being the underdog, but I think there's a reason that Georgia's preseason ranked where they are um, up at number one, and I, I think they're going to win in Atlanta on Saturday, and we'll also have the majority of the crowd. Scott, how are we feeling about that, that that big old matchup? I don't think Clemson has a prayer. Uh, I just think that, that Cade Klubnick is not the guy. He's not a leader. They don't rally around him. I think George is too good, too fast. They got too much size. They control the trenches. Uh, the line of scrimmage is their best friend. And I just believe that they're playing in Georgia. Uh, it, it's 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 not going to be close. I, I, I think I'm going to go with Georgia in the cover. Kim? 
Yeah, I, I'm with uh, everyone else here. I think Georgia is going to win. I think Clemson might be competitive maybe at the beginning, coming out, wanting to maybe, you know, make a statement or something like that early on. But I think Georgia kind of runs away with it in the second half and definitely, definitely win. I, I could see it going. I could see it being close. I could see Georgia kind of beating the spread there. But Georgia's definitely going to win that game. All right, I'm taking Georgia and the cover as well for everything that Scott said. I think Georgia is going to – might be close for about a half, but I think they're going to just hammer away at them uh, and comfortably cruise to a victory. We'll do it kind of like snake style, so I will take first on the next game. Miami uh, is at Florida. Miami a two-and-a-half point favorite at 230. I like the Hurricanes for everything that Scott and I were talking about earlier. I think that Cam Ward is going to be a lot of fun to watch this year. I think the Miami wide receiver core is got has enough versatile weapons to really attack a defensive backfield. Uh, and that defensive line is going to be really something serious. I think they're probably going to win right about 10, 13 points against Florida on Saturday uh, to get their season going. Kim, what about you? Yeah, I agree. I think Miami is going to win that game, and I definitely think they're going to cover the spread. I, I don't think it's going to be very close, it, definitely over one score. But, I mean, this is Miami's best chance to really really make a statement this year. And, and kind of, it's their, I think it's their best chance they've had in years to possibly win the ACC and make the playoffs. So I definitely think they're going to make a statement there week one. Scott? I believe that uh, two things are going to happen tomorrow. Cam Ward's going to throw for more than 300 yards. And Damian Martinez and Mark Fletcher are going to combine for more than 150 yards on the ground. And I think that if that happens, Miami wins by two scores at least. I'll just be a contrarian here. And uh, I, I don't honestly know enough about either team and what they have to make a super educated pick, but just the fact of – um, this game is in Gainesville and the pressure that Billy Napier has this year and with how loaded the rest of their schedule is, I think you, you don't want to say week one is a must win, but they, things don't really get much easier for him. And I just think because the game's at home, it's kind of a, a rivalry renewed. I think the Swamp's going to be rocking. Um, so I'll pick Florida just to do something a little different too. I like that. Oftentimes you go out on the island. <laughs> go out on the island. You might be the only smart one in the room. Uh, the only ranked game – well, no, excuse me. The only ranked game on Saturday that's on the sheet, number seven Notre Dame is at number 20, Texas A&M. The Aggies are a three-point favorite. Uh, I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, 6.30 – 6.30 on ABC. Katie, how you th do you think uh, the – Elko, Kevin Elko era gets started uh, on the right foot. Yeah, this is kind of a tough one because I think the 12th man is one of the um, toughest environments in college football. And normally I'm going to pick the SEC against Notre Dame, but then just because it is a first year head coach and Texas A&M lost a lot to the transfer portal even before, um, or kind of, you know, with the firing of Jimbo. And so um, I think I'm going to go with Notre Dame on the road to, to start off the season. I'm going to go with uh, Texas A&M. I, I, I like the Aggies at home. Uh, I think Mike Elko is going to have Riley Leonard's number. Uh, people forget that Mike Elko coached Riley Leonard at Duke, and he knows his tendencies. He knows what to do to get under his skin. Comparatively speaking, Riley Leonard knows how Mike Elko likes to scheme his offense and his defense, so he's going to know – what to look for, and they're going to have different signals and different audibles and checks that they're going to have to call. But uh, I'm going to take Elko and the Aggies uh, by seven. Yeah, I think I'm going to take Texas A&M too. I, I get the whole first-year head coach thing, um, and I can see it going either way, but I think Notre Dame is just one of those programs where they really – have a kind of a history of not really performing against you know really good teams i know so, sometimes they're really good sometimes they're really bad and i just think with a m playing at home um and how dominant uh the aggies program has been i would take a m too Ooh, Katie, I think I'm going to leave you on the island, and I'm going to take Texas A&M as well. Uh, the 12th man just being a little too much uh, for Notre Dame. Uh, 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 
Notre Dame on the road. So uh, that's three to one. Katie going on the island again, uh, but that means nothing because uh, none of us know anything. Our last game on Saturday is Western Kentucky at Alabama, number five, Alabama. Alabama, a 31 and a half point favorite. Uh, since we're doing it snake style, I am up first, and I am taking Alabama to cover the 31 and a half. I know that's a really big number, but last year when MTSU came to town, I took the underdog and came up uh, with egg on my face. So I'm taking Alabama, covering the 31 and a half. But what I like the most is the uh, I think it's 59 and a half is the uh, is the total is the over. If I were really gambling, and I am not, I want to make that clear to our listeners and viewers, I am not. This is just my for fun. Uh, if I were really gambling, I would spend my $10 on the over uh, Alabama and uh, Western Kentucky. I think the, the total is 59, and I, I wrote it down yesterday at 59.23. I think I'm going to back off it just a little bit. I think I'll go with 59 to 20. Uh, you still cover the 31, but you uh, get the over as well. Kim, what do you think? Your only game in Brian Denny this year, Alabama, 31 and a half point favorite over Western Kentucky. Yeah, I agree. I think Alabama is going to win it. I think they're going to cover the spread. I just feel, you know, with these home openers for Alabama in particular, everybody wants to score. Everybody wants to, you know, up up the game with the crowd. The crowd when the crowd really gets into it, there's no stopping Alabama. And I also feel like with the first game in the Kalen DeBoer era, that it's going to. I know Nick Saban had always been kind of, oh well, let's back off once we cover the spread type thing. But you know, you don't know if Kalen DeBoer is going to be that way. And I think everybody just kind of wants to win and, and kind of show that they're still going to be that dominant Crimson Tide program that they've been for the past 17 years. So I, I'm definitely taking Alabama to cover. I'm going to banish myself to purgatory, and I'm going to go with the uh, – I don't think Alabama is going to cover. It's all right. Uh, I think that they're going to have some problems with their receivers. They're, they're going to have a tough time on the perimeter just because it, they're new. And they're they're going to have a, a a difficult time moving the ball offensively through the air. I think they're going to rely more on Jalen Monroe running and extending plays with his legs and throwing checkdowns. Um, but I will agree with you on the total. And again, this is for entertainment purposes only. I don't want anybody using uh, my opinions for their. Um, for the for for their leisure, but uh, this is for entertainment purposes only. I do like the over. Uh, I just don't think Alabama is going to cover. I do think Alabama is going to give up some points on Saturday, just with the inexperience in the secondary and TJ Finley's experience in the SEC. But I do think Alabama is going to cover maybe a. 56-10, 56-17 on Saturday, but I kind of agree with Kim that when it's the first game, guys want to score. I think knowing what Alabama has coming up in weeks three and four, your first road trip at Wisconsin, then just a gentle uh, opening into the SEC with Kalen DeBoer at, with Georgia, uh, I think they're going to want to try and get some guys, some experience. Guys are going to want to find the end zone, so I think Alabama's going to cover. Our last two games, and we'll go kind of quickly here with Sunday, USC, number 23, USC is taking on number 13, LSU. The LSU Bengal Tigers are a four-point favorite in Las Vegas. I think Lincoln Riley is up a creek without a paddle, and LSU is going to take it to them on Sunday evening. Katie? Yeah, until USC proves to me that they can tackle well and play defense, I'm never going to pick them against an SEC team, so um, I'm, I'm going to go with LSU. I love, love, love USC in this game. Woo, okay. I think Lincoln Riley finally has his defense put together. He's hired uh, some good coaches, and he's, he's got the right horses out there. I think USC wins this one going away. Yeah, I, I agree with uh, Katie. I think uh, I think LSU wins it pretty easily. I think USC has struggled too much, and Lincoln Riley has struggled a little too much uh, to give me full confidence that that maybe he could he could pull that off. It isn't the I think the game's in Las Vegas, if I'm not mistaken. So they might have a heavier like USC crowd uh, just because of proximity. But I do think LSU is just a better football team, and I I, I think they come out of that pretty easily with a win. Scott, I hope you're right. That'll be uh, that would make for an entertaining story if LSU went out 
to Las Vegas and laid an egg. Our last game is Boston College at Florida State, Monday night, 6.30, 16 and a half points for Florida State. Oh, my gosh. I think Florida State is going to bounce back and get a win. Goodness gracious. 16 and a half points, though. Oh, feels too much. It feels too much. Kim, you're going last this time since you're the Boston College uh, reporter. We'll just spin it back around the same way. I think I'm going to I think I'm going to take Boston College plus the 16 and a half, but I think I will expect Florida State to win the game. Uh can, can, Katie, can, can keep us going here on the circle. I'm going to go with Florida State. I think they're going to they're obviously disappointed and frustrated with what happened in week 1. I think it's it'll be good for them that they're back at home and uh, they they have to a, after what happened with them last season going undefeated not making the playoff having all the, the controversy about trying to leave the ACC then they lose big one I think they have to I, you know I said about Florida earlier you can't really say week one's a must win and I'm not going to say this is a must win for, for Florida State but pretty close to it I think Florida State is still hung over from the Orange Bowl I think they haven't gotten that out of, out of their system yet I'm taking Boston College on the money line I think BC is going to win the game outright. I think Castellanos is going to have the game of, of his career, and they're going to give Bill O'Brien his first signature win. Yeah, I really hope you're right about that, Scott. I'm still leaning towards Florida State. Um, like I said earlier, um, my week the week zero game hasn't changed my mind. I just I agree with Katie, and I've talked about it before in your show. I feel like them playing at home in one of the toughest crowd environments. I feel like they're mad about not making the playoffs last year, and this is really the first time that fans are going to be able to watch them since that announcement of them not getting in. And I think they, after you know the tough loss in Ireland, I think they're going to want to prove something. But I don't think they cover. I definitely think it's going to be around maybe one possession, maybe a little less. It's going to be a very tight game, so I don't I don't see them covering, but I. Do you think Florida State comes out with the win on Monday night? Well, there we go. There's our picks. There's six marquee games all over the weekend, over the Labor Day weekend, the week one weekend. And we appreciate everybody joining us today on Football Friday. We want to say thanks to Kim Rankin, Scott Solomon, and Katie Windham for joining us, carving out an hour of their time. Follow them at Katie Windham underscore. Follow all of Katie's work at BamaCentral.com, the Alabama Crimson Tide on SI home. Follow Kim Rankin at KM Rankin 1, Boston College on SI. Follow Scott Solomon at Scott. Solomon NFL Miami Hurricanes on SI. We got a lot of work to do because all of our teams are in action over the weekend, and we hope you join us on our respective websites, the On SI Network. It's been a lot of fun hanging out with you guys on a football Friday. You watch us on the Bama Central YouTube channel, and you're listening to us on your favorite podcast platform, the Joe Gaither Show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and on Amazon. We appreciate Purple Turtle Roofing for sponsoring the program and Derek Daniel State Farm for sponsoring the program as well. We're going to be back next week to break down all the action, the Alabama-Western Kentucky game, Miami and Florida, Boston College and Florida State. And we'll bring back Joey Van Zimmeren to talk more in depth about Missouri and Murray State as well. We'll be back next week right here on the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central and BamaCentral.com. Thanks for joining us on today's edition of the Joe Gaither Show on Bama Central. Keep up with Joe on all his social media pages at Joe Gaither 6. Subscribe, rate, and review the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts, and be sure to read us daily at BamaCentral.com. <laughs>